Gardening is this amazingly nuanced hobby where every planting, every crop, and every harvest is different and unique. And sometimes along this journey for knowledge and insight, we need pinpoint answers without all that extra stuff. Enter the Garden Quickie. Hyper-focused, two-minute-ish videos covering a singular topic, answering all your growing questions. And the journey continues. Here's episodes 51 to 60. Hey, I hope you guys enjoy watching them as much as I enjoy making them. When your soil is so good, your garden is literally bursting at the seams. In truth though, nothing lasts forever. Even the best designs can fall victim to time. Or in this case, an errant lawnmower. I nicked this eight by two bed as I was passing by cutting the grass and totally blew the corner apart. I didn't just leave it though. I clamped it and put a couple of screws in thinking I had fixed it. But even the cinching pull force of three inch deck screws isn't enough for soil and plant roots, unfortunately. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we tackle all your gardening problems head on. In this case, garden bed repair. This is actually a bigger job than it looks. Time short, so let's get going. The first thing we have to do is dig out a portion of the soil. There's no way we're ever going to get this bed square and back together with hundreds of pounds of soil in the way. Okay, now that we can see what we're working with, let's measure the two damaged sides and see what we're in for for lumber. Measure twice, cut once. For corner repair on raised beds, it's almost always easiest to just build a new L shape and insert it inside. That's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna use solid two by fours all the way. I could use plywood, but I just don't feel comfortable with all the glues they use to make it. Not for a food producing bed. All right, with the boards all cut, I'll pre-assemble the insert to make it easier. Seems pretty solid. This should work out great. I'll go ahead and clamp the bed so it's perfectly square. Time for the insert. This thing fits like a glove. Square off the corners, screw it into place, and we're done. All I gotta do now is add back in the soil and we're all done. Nothing beats fixing something yourself, using your own two hands and your own ingenuity. Nothing except maybe the next episode of the Garden Queen. Right about now, gardeners across the Northern Hemisphere are knee deep in all their early indoor seedlings. It's awesome. I for one love it and I hope you guys all had the best sprouting success. The seeds contain all they need to grow right up until when the true leaves start to appear. Which is nice, because so far, we haven't had to do too much. But the small soil size, coupled with ultra-fast growth, means our young seedlings are going to get pretty hungry in short order. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we answer all your gardening questions. And today is all about feeding the seedlings. When do we start fertilizing? How much do we fertilize with? And how often do we do it? Time short, so let's dive in. Depending on the variety of seedlings you're growing and the conditions you're growing in, the second set of true leaves is gonna appear one to three weeks after germination. Remember, the first set of leaves are not actually real leaves. They're called cotyledons. 
the second set are the first true leaves, making the third pair the second set of true leaves. Which is not at all confusing. The easiest way for me to remember is that when the plants have six or more leaves, it's time to feed. Okay, now we know when to start feeding, but what do we fertilize with and how much of it do we use? This is important because too little or too weak of a fertilizer won't necessarily harm the plants. They just might not respond like you want. Too much or too strong of a solution, however, can be fatal. So try to err on the side of safety. Use a dilute, low-dose liquid organic feed. Things like seaweed extracts, kelp meal, anything with a balanced, low number NPK, and ideally some extra trace minerals. Now that your young seedlings have a firmly established root system, you can actually feed from above or below. I still prefer to feed from below. And for a fertilizing schedule, I feed every three weeks from the time the plants have two sets of real leaves. This means that your indoor seedlings will only ever need to be fed once, or maybe twice, the entire time before planting out in the garden. Fantastic. Hey, you know what else should be fantastic? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Everyone's looking for an advantage, and us gardeners are no different. What's going to make our crops grow bigger, better, and faster? Well, good soil, the right moisture and light, sprinkle in a few nutrients early on, and keep the air circulation high. Those are all great things, necessary things. But how do we gain an edge? How do we get an advantage for our gardens? Well, it turns out we can actually get a big one from the plants themselves. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we dive into the coolest parts of gardening. And today is all about adventitious roots. What exactly are they? How do they help us? And what plants can produce them? Time short, so let's get cracking. So what are these special roots we keep hearing about? Adventitious roots in plants are roots and side shoots that develop on locations other than the apical meristems. In English, they're just new roots that form on non-root plant tissue. You know, like stems and leaves. In the crops that us gardeners are going to be growing, they mostly occur near the root color. You know, where the soil meets the stem. Now, sometimes these adventitious roots will develop as a response to stress, but a lot of times, they're simply just a life strategy for these plants to take advantage of. Okay, so what do they do for the plant? Well, first and foremost, they increase the effective area of the root system. More roots means more water and more nutrients for the plants, and that means more growth. The ability to sprout roots from non-traditional spots on the plant means those varieties have an edge. An advantage for faster growth, more resistance to adverse conditions, and more stability, especially early on. The most well-known example of adventitious roots for all the plants we grow is tomatoes. And they're literally the best at it. It's why it's suggested to plant your tomatoes deep, or in the case of the long vine indeterminate ones, to actually plant them on their sides. We want the stems exposed to as much moist soil as possible to increase the amount of adventitious root formation. There's other plants that do it too. Plants such as chard, cucumbers, zucchini, basil, and all the nightshades, including peppers, eggplants, and potatoes. Gain a real advantage with adventitious roots this summer and accelerate your garden success. Know what else can accelerate your garden success? Quite likely the next episode of The Garden Quickie. If you've ever had trouble getting your carrots going, this could be the video for you. A relatively easy crop to grow, and without any special requirements, carrots are a hardy plant, taking on weather extremes like a champ. The problem for many new growers with carrots is just getting them started. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we solve all your gardening issues. And today is all about seeding your carrots successfully. Carrots are a long-growing, 
slow to germinate root crop. This does present some challenges, but nothing we can't overcome. Time is short though, so let's get cracking. For all the crops we grow, seed viability is never an issue, until it is. And unfortunately, carrots have one of the shortest shelf lives of any of the seeds we plant. While plants like tomatoes can grow from seeds five or six years old easily, the viability of carrot seeds goes down a great percentage every year. This leads many new growers to overplant them and just thin them out later. It's actually a pretty good strategy and it works well. But if you've been experiencing really poor germination results or none at all, first look to your seeds. Another issue that could be affecting your carrot seeding success is timing. You see, carrots, while often associated with cooler weather, actually sprout best when the soil is warm. 75 degrees Fahrenheit is the ideal temperature to germinate them. So if you have one of those long winters that lingers into spring, you know, and the temperatures stay cool, you could be experiencing delayed or even sporadic germination. It's not uncommon for carrot seeds to lie dormant and sprout up a month after planting, leading some growers to believe the planting to be a total failure. So, patience is key, but also plant at the right time. And lastly, one of the real tricky parts of growing carrots is that they're planted so shallow. Carrot seeds are planted only around a quarter inch deep. And with the seeds sown so shallow, in warmer temperatures taking a long time to germinate, you can quickly see the problem. It's very easy for the seeds to dry out, or worse, sprout, and then quickly desiccate. The real trick is keeping that top layer of soil moist enough for the seeds to sprout and get established for the length of time that's required. Some people will lay a board flat on top of the row after planting, checking every few days or so until germination. I find that a light dusting of straw mulch works equally as well, if not better, without all that maintenance. It keeps the soil nice and moist, you don't have to water nearly as much, and you'll be primed for sprouting success. Know what else is going to give you sprouting success? Quite likely the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Beets, an undemanding hardy root crop with nutrition that's off the charts, both in its famous taproot and its leaves. Easy to plant and care for, northern growers like me consider it a staple. One of the few crops I direct seed, just like carrots, Beets are often sown heavy and thin later. But what exactly does that entail? When do you do it? And how much room do beets actually need? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we cover all the relevant gardening topics. And today is all about beet spacing. I'm gonna cover when to space, how to space, and the amount of space our beets need. As always, time's short, so let's dive in. Beets are a bit of a tricky crop where even if you space the seeds diligently and methodically, they're still gonna need spacing. But why is that? It's because beet seeds are actually clusters of seeds. They're in a group called multigerms, and each cluster contains anywhere from two to six, sometimes even eight, actual beet seeds. So no matter what you do, and no matter how heavy or light you seed them, you're always going to be thinning later. Okay, so if beets are one of those crops that we thin to space, when do we actually do that? Well, to be truthful, it's not an exact science, and beets can be thin as early as a week after sprouting. Most growers wait until they're about 4 to 5 inches tall, with a couple of sets of true leaves. The advantage to this is, you can thin the weakest plants, leaving behind the best ones. For sure, you can go ahead and thin early at the seedling stage, but you'd have no way of knowing which is going to be the best plants. To thin, simply grab at the stem and pull out the plants you don't want. Or, if the roots are intertwined and you don't want to disturb the soil, you can trim right down at the root color. Easy stuff. As for how much space to give your beets, well, like all root crops, they hate competition. Beets, however, are a little more tolerant than, say, carrots or garlic. But... I do try to give them about three to four inches in all directions, just to ensure a maximum harvest. And hey, know what else is going to ensure a maximum harvest? Quite likely the next episode of The Garden Quickie. 
as an outsider looking in, people must think we're absolutely loony for how crazy us gardeners go in the early spring. Seeds everywhere, plants everywhere, pure unadulterated gardening chaos. But there's a method to the madness and a reason for all those frantic preseason preparations. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we cover all the gardening topics. And today is all about the benefits of early seed starting. Why do we start our seeds early indoors? And what are the advantages? Well, the list is long, but there's three main reasons. Time short as always, so let's dive in. The most obvious and common reason to start your plants early indoors is the head start. Our summer favorites need a specific amount of warm sunny days to complete their life cycle. If your summer's short like mine and it can't provide that, you need to start those crops early and plant them in the spring as established plants. That's the main and most common reason for planting early indoors, but there's more benefits if you're willing to dig a little deeper. Another benefit of starting the summer crops indoors is that you can keep growing the ones that are outdoors. By growing and establishing plants in a satellite location for the first part of their lives, you can delay planting in the garden to give your current crops more time to finish. Crops like this garlic, or these beets, or even these carrots. Let those crops have their time in the sun, but delaying the planting. Lastly, a huge benefit to pre-starting early indoors is choice. After just a few weeks, it becomes abundantly clear which of the young plants are superior to the others. By starting more than we need, we can choose the best specimens, which just isn't possible with direct seeding. So, you get a head start, your current crops get to complete their life cycle, and you only grow the best of the best. What could be better? The only thing I can think of would be the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Cover crops. Unique crops that are planted almost solely to protect our garden soils. It's always been very interesting to me to cultivate a plant not for the harvest, but simply as a placeholder in the off season. But that's precisely what cover crops are for. They reduce and eliminate erosion, mitigate temperature extremes, and they improve the soil by building organic matter, stability, and air, moisture, and nutrient retention. Pretty amazing stuff from one simple plant. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we talk about all the gardening strategies. And today is all about how to plant a cover crop. Cover crops are all about timing and method. Time short, so let's dive in. Normally, cover crops are planted in the fall to provide that winter protection and for maximum effect. Truth is, they can be planted at any time and still provide a variety of benefits. However, most cover crops need at least a three month growing window to achieve the maximum effect. This does include the germination time, so plant accordingly. We're having a crazy late winter here this year. This has pushed back the planting of my summer crops by at least a month. However, this is gonna allow me to get a quick cover crop into these two pepper beds here, so let me show you how I do it. Cover crops, like this fall rye here, are normally grasses, or other quick growing shallow rooted type plants. The easiest way to plant them is to prep the bed first with a perfectly flat, moist landing pad of fresh soil. Next, simply broadcast the seeds on top of that soil. Now, seeding rate does vary between the different varieties of plants, but I aim for at least 30 to 40% coverage with the seeds themselves. This is gonna allow them to balloon to 100% coverage or more, once they start growing. Cover those seeds with about a half inch of potting soil or sifted compost and wait for the magic. Grasses like fall rye are best cut down right before the seeding stage. This prevents them from sprouting back up. I'm not gonna get that option here with these beds. It's too quick of a turnaround. So I should be prepared for some sprout back after I cut it down. No big deal though. Know what is a big deal though? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. As first year garden beds, these two eight foot planter boxes provided unreal bounty. Built just in time for summer, 
I filled and planted them with peppers edge to edge. And as new beds do with new soil, they produced like crazy. And at the end of the season, the harvest was remarkable. But new garden beds are not like seasoned garden beds. The dreaded annual soil drop is real. And if we don't intervene, these beds won't stay productive for long. Enter cover crops. These protective living canopies can be used to shape the future success of your new raised beds and avoid that sophomore slump that we see so often. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we build a better garden one crop at a time. And today is all about the benefits of cover crops. I love cover crops. The benefits are many and wide ranging. I picked out three main ones today, but time is ticking. So let's get into it. As a disclaimer, cover crops usually are planted in the fall for maximum winter protection, but we can still see some benefits with an early spring application. And just what are those benefits? Well, like we've already touched on and as part of the name itself, cover crops provide cover. When planted as a thick blanket, crops like this fall rye here provide a living protective barrier against erosion, desiccation, wind, temperature extremes, and even frost heaving. And they go a step further than just protection. Cover crops can actually build your soils. First year garden beds almost always sink, upwards of 20 to even 30%. We're lucky here because we have large amounts of compost so we can build them back up. But, it's a losing game. It's a losing game without that binding action of an extensive root system. Cover crops solve this by building and binding that soil. And they do this by increasing organic matter, improving stability of the soil profile, especially at the surface, and by increasing air, water, and nutrient retention. All things that a healthy soil needs. And a third benefit for our cover crops that's immediately tangible is weed control. By growing as a thick cover, this fall rye will smother and outcompete any weeds, both from below and above. Existing weeds are going to be choked out with ease, and incoming weed seeds won't even have a chance to get started. Good stuff. Hey, you know what else is good stuff? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. With the spring swing in full gear, hopefully you've been blessed with more germination success than you know what to do with. Once you get the hang of the right moisture, the right temperature, the seeding of cells, the plants do most of the early work. And work they do. In the right conditions, seeds sprout with gusto. But in the comfy confines of indoors or in a greenhouse, they're gonna to continue to grow at an accelerated rate, almost exponential in nature. It'll soon be time for some new digs. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we give you all the gardening tips. And today's episode is all about increasing your transplanting success. If you only grow a few specimens and you're able to start your seeds in larger pots, you can likely skip the transplanting until it's time to get those plants out into the garden. Transplanting is a shock to the system, and we really try to avoid it unless it's necessary. But in the case of a very late and extended winter, or monstrous zucchini plants that have completely outgrown their plug trays, it becomes necessary. And there's a few things that we growers can do to ensure a smooth transition from a plug to a larger pot. I've singled out three for today, time short as always, so let's get into it. The first tip to eventually getting tomato transplants like this is timing. It's better to move your plugs and small plants on a little bit too late than it is to do it too early. You'll want the plant to be firmly established both above the ground and below. No matter what the variety, moving young plants on too early before they're ready is not a good idea. Wait until your young plants have multiple whorls of true leaves, usually no earlier than four to six weeks after initial germination. I'm just starting to harden off this rainbow chart here and it's looking a little sad sack. It's okay, it'll come back. But it brings me to my second tip, and that's moisture. 
No matter which way you shake it, transplanting is a shock to the system. And the biggest way to minimize that shock is adequate moisture. You can't plant your seedlings into dry soil and expect them to flourish. Pre-soak any new soil for at least two hours prior to planting. It's better for the plants and it's better for you because making those holes to insert the plugs is infinitely easier when the soil is able to hold itself together. And the last tip for transplanting success is to be gentle. Whatever you do, don't tug on the stems to pull the plugs out for planting. Even if the stem itself doesn't literally break, you can bruise and damage the transport tissues. No tissues means no water and no nutrient uptake. That's not going to make for a healthy plant. You know what is going to make for healthy plants though? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. You often hear gardeners lamenting, if I only had a greenhouse, or if I had a greenhouse, I could grow anything. What is it about greenhouses that makes them so special? Why do gardeners think they're this avenue to the ultimate garden? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farm. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we break down all the aspects of gardening. And today, it's all about greenhouses. Or more specifically, their benefits. I've got six of them today, and as always, time short. So let's get into it. Probably the most obvious benefit of greenhouses that comes to mind immediately is the extension of the growing season, especially for long fruiting types like these tomatoes here. With warmer temperatures, we can plant earlier in the spring and harvest for longer later on. With no danger of a cold snap wiping out more sensitive crops, the spring and fall frost dates just become days on the calendar, instead of these looming times of regiment. Another key benefit is pest avoidance. Deers, rabbits, moles, voles, and rodents are mostly kept at bay. No more digging up or munching on our favorite crops. And on top of that, growing in a greenhouse provides serious weed control. The majority of weeds in our gardens are opportunistic plants that come in from the wind. In a greenhouse, they just don't get a chance to get established. Point for us. And because greenhouses are this closed, controlled environment, with enough sunshine and the right construction, we can grow year-round. If you're no longer at the mercy of the season, climate, or weather, you can enjoy fresh harvests 12 months of the year. Another key benefit of greenhouses is that they provide the ultimate place to start plants before the season even begins. With a big head start, those long growing plants like tomatoes and peppers get that much needed early boost. And finally, a greenhouse is a safe, warm place to work. No matter what it's doing outside, you can plant and putter away nice and dry. Hey, you know what else is going to be nice and safe? The next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.